Hey War Pugs, the Shivo Nive wanted me to check out the real tank genius of World War II, Percy Hobo Hobart. And this is from the Fat Electrician. And this was also called out on the shenanigan stream multiple times. Um, so, once again, here we are. I'm about to hear somebody I haven't heard of before. And it's coming from the Fat Electrician. I know it's going to be good. I know it's going to be informative. It's always, I am a, I'm a huge fan of history, guys. I'm just a huge fan of history. No ins, ands, or buts about it. Um, so, anytime Fat Electrician comes up, Drakenfell comes up, anything like that, you guys know I'm going to be interested in it. Um, all that being said, I don't think I need to say much more. Fat Electrician has wonderful sponsors. You guys should check out the links in the description below. Also, his merch store is going to be down there as well as my own. Let's get into this. Let's have some fun. Let's go, War Pugs. Just made it onto the beaches at D-Day, and what I found instead... Oh, let me when, rewind it. When I started this video, I just wanted to know how the tanks made it onto the beaches at D-Day, and what I found instead is one of the greatest anti-hero stories of all time, oh. and it rewrote my understanding of history. <laughs> Today we're talking about the man that quite literally wrote the book on armored warfare. A World War I veteran that was forced into early retirement because his fellow officers didn't like him very much. But really? after German tanks rampaged through France and North Africa utilizing their new Blitzkrieg tactic, Winston Churchill himself would call upon this man to leave retirement and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the infamous German tank commanders Erwin Rommel and Heinz Guderian. Ladies and gentlemen- This is seriously not the first time I've heard somebody set up like this. You don't like somebody, so therefore, you dismiss their talents. Well, then the hero of D-Day that you've probably never heard of, Major General Sir Percy Cleghorn Stanley Hobart, a.k.a. Hobo. But first, Never heard sponsor. of sponsor. This video is brought to you by Delete Me. Delete Me is an online subscription service. It's a very straightforward, simple business. You give them money, they get rid of your personal information off the internet. Okay, look, here's the deal. Somehow, some way, your personal information is on the internet. Your name, your spouse's name, your parents' name, your address, your last five addresses, your phone numbers, and all of your emails this are all sitting stuff. in some data broker's bank, and they're selling that information for money. But the good news is that these data brokers are legally required to delete your information if you submit an opt-out request. And that's where Delete Me comes in. They will go to all the big data brokers and automatically submit opt-out requests on your behalf this will stop you from getting telemarketer calls and you don't have to do anything and i know what you're thinking because i thought the same thing i don't want to give all my personal information to delete me either because that just seems counterproductive okay here's the thing with that you don't have to give them all your private information you can literally give them your name and your email address you can give them more information if you want but really all they need is your name and email and then you come back a few days later and they just start asking you a bunch of yes or no questions by using just your name and email they'll search through all the data banks and figure out who you are and they'll ask you a bunch of weird questions like is this your dad is this your mom is that a relative is this your address? Did you used to live here? Did you grow up at this address? Is this your phone number? Is this your email? They know all of this information just by you giving them your name and email using all the information that these data brokers have. And then you just oh, let God. them know, yes, that's me. And then they will delete all that information for you. A couple nice. days after that, they're going to send you a report. Here was mine. Over 70 data brokers had my information and there were 489 listings where that information was for sale and delete me submitted opt-out requests for all of them. Now those data nice. brokers are probably going to be able to get my information again, but Delete Me is constantly going to be searching for my info and automatically submitting the requests as soon as those listings pop up. Go check out Delete Me. I'll have a link and a discount code down below. Let's get back to the video. Did I not tell you this guy has just bawling sponsors, okay? Seriously? Percy Hobart was born in India in 1885 and joined the British military in 1902. He would then go on to fight in World War I. While there, in typical anti-hero fashion, he made a name for himself as being extremely effective, but unorthodox and disobedient at the same time. Nice. Because of this, many of the other British officers don't really care for him. Despite that, he makes it through World War I, ends up earning himself a military cross, and then in 1919, he goes off to college. Graduates from college four years later in 1923, he then volunteers to be an officer in the Royal Tank Corps. Now, he volunteers because most people did not want this position. And right. that's because at this point in time, a lot of the high-ranking British officers didn't see the true potential that tanks and armored vehicles had. They simply viewed them as a single tool for trench warfare to get from one trench to the other. They didn't realize that one day it was going to replace cavalry. Percy Hobart, on the other hand, was a visionary and saw its true potential, and that's why he volunteered. Not only that, Makes he was sense. also very vocal about this opinion, and he would actually persuade a lot of the younger soldiers to believe the same thing, which honestly isn't a very hard sell. The new guy 
guy joins the army and you're like, hey, quick question. Did you want to ride a horse into battle or did you want to drive a fucking tank? Okay, everybody's <laughs> picking a tank. And over time, his advocacy for change ends up making a lot of the old cavalry <laughs> officers end up hating him because he's kind of trying to make them obsolete. And you have to remember at this point in time, the British officer corps is very, very clicky. Like they're socialites and gentlemen and they have to, you know, conduct themselves in a certain manner and all that BS. So when Hobart comes in and starts ruffling feathers, it upsets the entire officer corps and they all pretty much hate him at this point. Despite mm -hmm. that, he knows he's right and he just keeps working on pioneering new tactics and new applications for tanks. Now, one of the few legitimate concerns about having tanks on the battlefield at this point in time was that they were basically autonomous. And what I mean by that is once the tank crew got their orders, hopped in the tank and took off, that was it because tanks didn't have radios and stuff yet at this point in time. So once they left, you couldn't call them back. You couldn't change up the mission. They couldn't communicate with anybody outside of that tank. Mm -hmm. So Hobart comes out and he's like, well, hey, rather than not using tanks because they can't communicate, how about we just, I don't know, put some radios inside of them. So he what a thought. for like a year to make that happen, gets radios put in all of his tanks and then trains his guys how to run battle drills, being able to actually communicate with each other and the chain of command. And guess what? it works exactly how you would expect it to. I mean, this is the upside down ketchup bottle of the tank world. Like somebody finally came out with this idea and everybody's like, how? How did I not come up with that billion dollar idea? At this point, all the junior officers and lower enlisted are like, holy shit, this is awesome. And all the older, more experienced officers that already hated Hobart lose their shit because he's now actively making them look stupid. What? It's always somebody pointing out the obvious that literally no one else has thought of before. It's always that one person. And you see this repeated time and time and time again. Like, it's always a simple solution. It's like one of my favorite examples of this is during the, uh, the First Punic War when the Romans sucked at naval warfare. They were excellent at, at warfare on the ground, but they sucked at naval warfare. And one of them just said, well, why don't we just put this big old piece of crap on a hinge, this big plank on a hinge with a spike on the end of it, and we'll turn naval warfare into, we'll turn naval warfare into ground warfare. How about that? And they did it, and they just dominated. Our true story. Those you are wearing his merchandise. <laughs> so once that gets worked out he starts developing legitimate battle strategies and drills and training his men on how to conduct tank warfare how to integrate tanks with infantry really laying the groundwork for what would become modern tank warfare this goes on for a couple of years and then in 1927 he ends up being a co-respondent in a divorce case now oh. i'll be honest i had to google what that meant but apparently co-respondent is the fancy british officer polite way of saying Percy Hobart was banging somebody else's wife. Her name oh. was Dorothea Field, and of course, she was another British officer's wife. Naughty, naughty. After that mm -hmm. divorce is finalized, Dorothea and Percy get married pretty much immediately, and the rest of the officer corps now absolutely hates him, and they actively try to get him kicked out of the military because this is not gentlemanly behavior. They're not right. able to get it done. Hobart stays in the military and continues to develop and refine armored warfare, and one of the things he starts to do is look back into history and see if there's any lessons that he can apply to tank warfare, and one of the things things that he hones in on is the Mongols. The Mongols were so yes. successful because they utilized cavalry to strike deep into enemy territory at strategic points, weakening their entire empire. And Hobart says, what if I could do the same thing, but with tanks? And right. to anybody that knows a lot about history, that sounds an awful lot like the German Blitzkrieg tactic. And that's because it, it is. is. Yeah, the Germans didn't come up with the Blitzkrieg. Percy Hobart did. Heinz Gedermann, the German tank commander that is the architect of the Blitzkrieg, is well known to have had every single paper that Percy Hobart published translated into German, and he wow. kept that with him everywhere he went. Yeah, the infamous German tank commanders Rommel and Gedermann didn't revolutionize armored warfare. They just copied Hobart's homework. So if Percy Hobart is the actual Plagiarism. genius behind the Blitzkrieg, why don't most people know that? Why does everybody give Germany credit, and why didn't the British use it? Oftentimes because we, ha we have this weird thing that we do in Western civilization where we make our enemies appear more powerful and more competent than they actually are. We do that. Painfully. At first. Or at the very least, 
know that it was a possibility when it was used against them in France when they got their asses beat in six weeks. That is because the British chain of command hated the man that came up with the Blitzkrieg and for that reason made the entire strategy a failure. In 1934, Britain conducted a large training exercise where Percy Hobart was going to be allowed to try out his new methods. If you don't know, when you're conducting a large military training exercise, you have like Team A, Team B, and then you have the umpires, so to speak. You right. have the people making sure that both teams are doing the right things, saying, yeah, yeah, that works. No, that doesn't work. Declaring who wins and who loses. The umpires conspired against Hobart because they were military officers and they didn't like him oh and basically God. made his entire strategy fail. Fast forward 1937, Hobart is given command of the 1st Armored Division, Great Britain's first modern tank division. Because of this, a bunch of British officers promptly throw a bitch fit and try to get Hobart kicked out of the military again. again. It fails again, but the chain of command has to come up with a compromise and that compromise is to take Hobart and send him down to Egypt where he can take command of the second armored division which was basically we're going to ship him halfway across the world and then pretend he doesn't exist out of sight out of mind right so no. Hobart gets down to Egypt and it is a complete shit show because tanks are effectively replacing cavalry at this point so it's cavalry officers that are running tank divisions and they have chosen to not read any of the literature or training material that he has spent the last decade developing and they are operating tanks like they are dragoons if you don't know a dragoon is kind of like cavalry except it's it's not they ride in on horses and then they dismount and go into battle on foot and that's what the second armored division is being trained to do they roll up in the tank and then the gunner and the loader stay in the tank while the rest of the crew gets out and fights like infantry that's just while being stupid a static target that's just stupid that is 100 percent clinically stupid out of a moving target, which is the entire point of being a fucking tank. The chain of command is effectively trying to do everything they can to make tanks look bad and ineffective because by extension, it makes Hobart look bad and ineffective. The oh my joke God. when Hobart gets there is that the Egyptian- What is it this past week? What is it this past week? Every single historical request has that has come through has been about a bunch of people who should have known better, who should have known better acting like toddlers asinine behavior from people that should know better and all it does is get people killed doesn't even kill the enemy force is the Egyptian farce and the mobile division is the immobile division. But when Hobart shows up, he turns the entire thing around. Between 1930 and 1940, he trains this entire division how to actually conduct tank warfare and they get super effective at it. And the men absolutely love him. Because Percy Hobart is not only a great teacher, but he actually wants every man under his command to understand what they are doing and why they are doing it. When at this point in time, many other officers don't care about that. They just right. Right. to shut up and follow orders but percy hobart wants you to know what you should be doing exactly. and why you should be doing it that way if the chain of command ever fails you can make intelligent decisions regarding what needs to be done in lord preserve us from brain dead behavior Short, Percy Hobart treats his men like they're grown ass men and they absolutely love him for it. And because of that, he gains overwhelming support from the junior officers and enlisted men and he becomes immensely popular. No, don't like that. And because of this, they finally force him out of the military because they sent him down to Africa, intentionally sabotaged him, and yet again, he's managed to turn the entire situation around and turns it into a positive thing. So they just end up getting him fired. In 1940, he is forced into early retirement. On his final departure from Egypt, the men of the second armored division lined the entire road to wish him farewell as their sign of how much they actually respected this man. So Percy goes back home, but still wanting to be involved in the military, he joins the home guard, which is like the British equivalent of the national guard. Right. And he gets busted down from Lieutenant general to corporal, which if you don't know military ranks is like going from CEO to front desk receptionist. Not that I'm trying to talk about about receptionists, but I'm trying to give you an accurate depiction of what a drastic change in authority this is. Five months after Hobart's forced into retirement, the German military rolls into France with tanks, utilizing the Blitzkrieg tactic that Percy Hobart designed and completely stomps the British and the French army in a matter of six weeks. Erwin Rommel then goes and proceeds to rampage through North Africa, and the only people that even kind of slow him down are Hobart's men of the 2nd Armored Division that is My now known God. as the 7th Armored Division, a.k.a. AKA the Desert Rats. At this point, Winston Churchill
Mitchell starts asking questions and realizes what his officer corps has done, and he personally calls Percy Hobart back into service and awards him the rank of Major General. At yes. which point, all of the officers throw a fit yet again, saying that he's 57. At this point, shut the fuck up. At this point, shut up. Seriously, just shut up. Nobody cares anymore. You, like, you have... You ignored this guy. They used his tactics against you, having to translate his books into their language to do it. And you're so pissed off about this guy, you'd rather throw all that away. Oh my god, stuff like this pisses me right off. I don't care if you don't like him. I really don't give a shit if you don't like him years old, he's too old to serve in the military, and they try to get a med boarded out. Winston Churchill yet again intervenes and stops the med board and issues this statement, quote, the high commands of the army are not a club. It is my duty to make sure exceptionally able men, even though not popular with their military contemporaries, are not prevented from giving their services to the crown. Translation, quit being a bunch of catty bitches, we need this guy. By the time all that political BS gets done, Rommel is back in Europe and he is- Imagine being such a, such a bunch of whiny bitches that you almost cost your country a major war been tasked with fortifying the Atlantic Wall, the German defense from Norway to Spain in case the Allies should invade. Rommel reinforces it with 260,000 men manning over 15,000 concrete bunkers and artillery positions. The entire thing is coated with barbed wire. It has anti-vehicle emplacements to prevent tanks and other vehicles from getting up the beach and they lay over 200 million mines. And the man put in charge of figuring out how to penetrate those defenses is none other than Percy Hobart. He has re-entered the picture and he knows that these kids have been stealing his homework. He comes in with the complete dad energy of, I taught you everything you know, but I didn't teach you everything I know. He takes command of nice. the 79th Tank Regiment and gets to work immediately. It is now Major General Hobart and Erwin Rommel going toe to toe in a battle of wits that will determine the fate of the world. And obviously we're gonna handle this issue with tanks, which brings us to problem number one. On. How are we going to get tanks on the beach? How are we going to get a 70,000 pound hunk of metal with a gun from the boat through the water onto the beach? Obviously, we just got to make a tank float and it can't be that hard because battleships float, right? I mean, right. those are big and heavy and made out of metal. So why can't we do the same thing with the tank? All you have to do is displace enough water and bada bing, bada boom, you're floating. So all we got to do is increase the surface area of a tank. So they take a gigantic tube of wax canvas, wrap it around the tank, and then have inflatable tubes that when they inflate it, the canvas stands straight up. And basically it is a tank inside of a giant canvas tube. And then we'll just add a couple of little boat propellers on the back of the tank. So it'll push itself through the water. Problem solved. Sounds stupid. Works terrific. So now that we've got the Sherman duplex drive amphibious tank figured out, the next problem, <laughs> what is the beach made out of? Are the tanks going to get hung up and stuck? Because we can't have that happen happening either. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a submarine. We're going to send them out. They're going to wait till night. Once night falls, the sailors are going to go ashore, gather up a bunch of the dirt from the beach and figure out what it's made out of. It's right. made out of blue clay, probably the worst possible thing because those tanks will for sure get stuck in clay. So obviously problem number two, how on earth are we going to get the tanks through all this blue clay? It would be really nice if we had a road. You know what? Fuck it. We're just going to bring our own road. Ladies and gentlemen, the bobbin. That is a Churchill tank with a gigantic spool of canvas that has metal rods inside of it that literally goes ahead first and lays down a road for all the other tanks to drive on right up the beach. My Again, it looks God. really silly, but it works super well. At this point, all the other people that hate Hobart are starting to make fun of them. They're starting to refer to these tanks as Hobart's funnies, but they have no idea how important these tanks are gonna end up being. Hobart is over here actually trying to save the world by any means necessary. He realizes it doesn't matter how cool it looks, he just needs it to work, and he only needs it to work once. Meanwhile, all of his other contemporaries are worried about looking good while they do it. Okay, problem number three, marching right up the beach. Now we have to worry about the mines and the barbed wire. Right. We can't be blowing the tracks off our tanks with mines. We need to clear the barbed wire for the men and we don't want the barbed wire getting hung up in the tracks of the tank. What are we gonna do? Things are about to go from looking weird and silly to looking terrifying and awesome <laughs> because the plan for this is to eat the barbed wire and blow up the mines in front of us 
using the Sherman Crab, AKA the flail tank. Okay, so just so we're on the same page, in theory, we have now figured out how to sail a fucking tank a mile through the ocean, right. build a road in front of us as we drive it up the beach, cut through barbed wire and detonate mines. The only defensive structure left is the enormous concrete bunkers with Germans inside shooting machine guns and mortars. What are we gonna do about them? Because normal tank guns aren't gonna take those out effectively. Right. Which is a pretty simple solution. If your gun isn't big enough, just get a bigger gun. Ladies and gentlemen, the Petard. It is essentially a mortar that is the size of a propane tank, affectionately dubbed the Flying Dust Bin. <laughs> you call that big? Yeah, the thing's huge. That explains a lot. What is that supposed wow. to be? Wow. You told me eight inches. And you told me you took installments. I didn't know what that meant. That's your problem. Interrupting my history. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. And if the flying dustbin doesn't work, this one will. The most terrifying of all of the creations, the crocodile, a.k.a. Oh, yeah. the flamethrower tank, pulling a armored trailer with 500 gallons of jungle jelly capable of shooting flames over 250 yards. So oh. if everything goes according to plan so far, the enemy is either going to be dead or retreating. Here's the problem. Once the enemy starts retreating, they're also going to start blowing up all the bridges behind right. them, making it very hard to maneuver vehicles, especially tanks, across ravines, rivers, ditches, and so on. So, what are we gonna do once they blow up the bridges? Ooh. Fuck it, I guess we'll just bring a bridge from home, right? No, I'm not messing with you. Ladies and gentlemen, bridge tank. Oh man, it went from this is kind of silly and there's no way that's gonna work to oh my god, that's terrifying to okay, now you guys are just showing off. And I know what you're thinking, that's great, but what if it's just a little tiny anti-tank ditch or a ravine, not something that really necessitates an entire bridge? Well, that's easy, ladies and gentlemen, the fascine, aka a bundle of sticks. So that's it, the plan is set. Hobart has accounted for absolutely everything and this plan is for sure gonna work. But here's the thing, you've probably seen a bunch of movies or yeah. played a bunch of video games that incorporate the landing at Normandy on D-Day and you've never seen any of this stuff. So why is that? That's because most movies and video games like Saving Private Ryan, for example, take place on Omaha Beach, which was one of the American beaches, right. and the Americans didn't have access to all of Hobart's tanks. Why is that? Well, some people believe that the American leadership saw it and said that it was stupid, not going to work, and they didn't want anything to do with them. However, that's a myth and it's completely untrue. Omar Thought Bradley so. saw Hobart's inventions and requested all of them. Unfortunately, not enough could be made in time, and the only thing the American forces would be given for D-Day was the Sherman DD duplex drive amphibious tanks. And the reason that Hollywood focuses on Omaha Beach is because it's the most dramatic. It's the one beach of the five where absolutely everything went wrong. And believe right. it or not, one of the main things that went wrong was that the Sherman duplex drive tanks didn't make it. They got released too far off the beach and the seas were too rough and a lot of them ended up sinking. Luckily, only five tankers drowned. The rest were able to escape and get picked back up by the boats. But it was a huge issue not having tanks on Omaha Beach, and it is part of the reason that Omaha was the deadliest beach on D-Day. If you pay attention and you know what you're looking for, it's even referenced in the Saving Private Ryan movie. No armor has been in the shore. We got no DD tanks on the beach. Dog one is not open. So just so we're all on the same page, the reason most people have never okay. seen or heard about these things is because they weren't at Omaha Beach and Hollywood focuses on Omaha Beach because it was the deadliest, most brutal battle. But right. the reason that it was the deadliest battle was quite literally in part due to the fact that Hobart's funnies weren't there to help the Allies fight. These tanks are quite literally a victim of their own success. To give you an example of how big of an impact they had on the other beaches, the next deadliest beach after Omaha is Juno, and it had less than half the casualties. But Hobart and the 79th yeah. Armored Division's contributions aren't done on D-Day. At Let's this go. point, Hobart decides, rather than keeping all of his men together as one unit, like pretty much every other type of armored unit did, he decided that he was gonna split them up and attach them and their specialty tanks to all the other units of the Allied forces, essentially turning his tank division into the special forces of tanks. Need to clear some mines? Here's the crab. You need to scare some Germans? Here's the crocodile. By the end of World War II, the Germans were 
so scared of the crocodile flamethrower tank that they would start to surrender at the mere sight of it. The 7th oh. Division and Hobart's Funnies fought all the way through the European theater, and when they finally came up to Germany, the first Allied forces to cross the Rhine into Germany did it in Hobart's duplex drive Sherman tanks. Because nice. Hobart's Funnies and the 79th Armored Regiment were spread out amongst all the other units in the European theater, every time a unit did something special, credit was given to that unit, and the contributions by Hobart Hobart's men and the Hobart funnies would go unnoticed and unrecognized. So in conclusion, this was a story of Major General Percy Hobart, the man that pioneered modern tank warfare, the man that trained the men that beat Rommel in North Africa, the actual inventor of the Blitzkrieg tactic, and one of the most important architects of D-Day and the Allied advance through Europe. In the pages of history, oh he was a God. victim of his own success because everywhere he wasn't was such a catastrophic shit show that it monopolized the spotlight, and everywhere he was, things went so smooth that it wasn't worth reporting, so he went unnoticed. When people think of tank warfare in World War II, way too many people think of Erwin Rommel and Heinz Guderian, when in reality, they should be thinking of Percy Hobart, and I hope this video helps with that. Thanks for watching. Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch over thefatelectrician.com. Quack bang, out. Nice. Okay. Get this off. Cat's in the way, of course. You're in the way. Hey, cat. Guys, once again, I'm learning something through this channel I didn't know before. And seeing some things. Now, I had seen these tanks, but they would often put... when The last time I saw some of these types of tanks, um, well, I knew about that uh, crocodile just based off playing War Thunder with Icy. But, as far as the rest of these tanks went... They just put them in like as like strange tank number one, especially like the uh, crab. Um, this was something else. I love learning about stuff like this. I love learning about hidden figures in history that I never knew about before. And just finding out about certain people can completely change your outlook on the way on the the way things went. And another thing, never underestimate the power of absolute human pettiness because holy crap. You're willing to let your country lose a major war because you can't stop being a petty little bitch. War pugs, all the links are gonna be in the description below. Fatelectrician.com, get yourself some merchandise. Go by check my links in the description below. I'm gonna head out from here. Cause I'm gonna go be a petty little bitch for a while. My wife's gonna make fun of me. Probably smack this out the head. I'll catch you guys next time. My god. <laughs>